Hey. Thank you, Jason. Sure. Hi, Amen. How are you? Good, good. Apologies for what seemed like to be some some uh, internet connection on that. Yeah, a little choppiness. Yeah. Choppy waters um, to start the journey. Yeah, exactly. Um, speaking of starting the journey, mm -hmm. here we go. <laughs> So I actually really uh, appreciated one moment of the choppiness uh, in uh, Jason's communication, uh, for which I'm really grateful. Thank you for the good words about um, uh, my books and Eamon's works. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, but there was one moment, at least on my end, where there was one sentence which um, went something like, gold seen engaged and, and then it cut off. Right? Uh, and, and there was this wonderful way in which that gold scene and engaged and then an absence is so very appropriate for your work. Um, and you've already shown one slide of one of your paintings which uh, uh, clearly uh, have and um, uh, foreground um, uh, the use of gold pigmentation, gold paint. And uh, for me, um, um, in examining your works, I think that this is maybe one of the best entry points just for starting off. Here's another beautiful one. Um, um, uh, is to think about uh, the fact that when people think about the early Spanish colonial expropriation in the Americas, primitive accumulation, one of the prominent objects that comes to mind is gold. Right? Gold was the primary object for which the Spaniards were desperately searching long before the harvesting of agricultural possibility and slave labor was even uh, being considered. Uh, uh, gold was the thing. Um, as someone, you, who's committed to artistically, uh, uh, even politically, I would say, to decolonial ideals, how do you think about gold in your works? How, how um, um, have you figured such prominent use of gold and, and, and the kinds of political questions that come with gold uh, into your paintings. And I would say that the pictures here uh, really don't do um, the work justice because you can't really photograph gold pigment, right? It doesn't, it, doesn't have, yeah. like, it doesn't have that kind of like luster that it has when you're right in front of it, right? And also yeah. because the way in which the screens are like lighting the, the background or something. So yeah. you can't really see it. So I really encourage people to visit the exhibition if they can in spring 2021. Uh, but I just you know, want to start by asking, maybe you could say a little bit more about gold, the history of gold work in Peru and, and your broader engagement with that tradition. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it, it is a challenge to, to capture the gold. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a challenge as a painter mm. and it's a challenge, I think, to disseminate that type of like imagery mm -hmm. on many levels mm. um, and I think like one thing that just like the, the hearing your your question that made me think about kind of my approach to how I came to the to the use of gold was um, you know through almost through and uh, within the context of ritual, mm. you know, within the context of, um, I think looking for something, you know, searching, mm. you know, um, and and it comes out of like a very deep and personal space, mm -hmm. um, a personal experience that that involves the, the experience of a, a lot of loss on some levels, like the, the, the loss of, of somebody very close to me. And that experience kind of forced me into this place of, of ritual, of like what my daily rituals are, which is painting, oh. you know? And I think like in terms of like, you know, the the context around gold you know initially as an artist it was something that i was drawn to on a purely aesthetic level you know something that that 
was more like a magnetic pull to it. Um, and it wasn't until later that, I, that, you know, that I start to kind of understand the, 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 the different facets to the material, you know? Wow. And I wow. think in terms of like, and it's interesting because I know that like in terms of gold, gold work in the Americas, you know, the more that I read about it, um, it began in Peru near Lake Titicaca and it, and it began more in that context of ritual um, and separate from other metallurgical kind of developments that was more, you know, in other cultures around the world, metallurgy was developed based around um, uh, trade and, and more practical type of uses, you know, tools. Weapons. Yeah, weapons. And in the Americas, it was more towards um, regalia mm. and, and towards the idea of, of ritual. And I think it's one of those things that as an artist, you know, you, you're exploring material all the time and you just happen to come across that, that moment where you found the thing you were looking for, you know? And in terms of like um, what I was mentioning before, like in terms of like experiencing that, that moment of loss in terms of like personal loss, um, I think that it appeared to me in that, in that way. And in, in some ways, I think that's how the, like, how the dialogue began. That's fantastic. I, yeah. I love the idea that the paint taught you the questions you were looking for, right? That you were yeah. the paint. Yeah, I, I don't really think, I, I think like when you, when you try to bring an idea to, to the process, it doesn't always work. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of times the material has to drive it. That's fantastic. Yeah, That's yeah. Fantastic. I have like two uh, branching questions and I, I'm not gonna try to connect them. So I'm gonna kind of like, stack them up for now. I want to ask, uh, just as a quick follow-up, how um, you're thinking about ritual in relation to this work. Because when I see it, I can see that the paintings have um, um, uh, this really delicate and careful quality. Right? It, I can tell that it takes a lot of time to make one of these paintings. Uh, just thinking about the way in which uh, color intersects and overlays and it, it, they just look like there is a lot of uh, the time element involved. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how you're thinking about time, ritual, maybe even time ritual and loss. Uh, and that I think will connect to my next question. Well, so to give you context in terms of like what I mentioned about that experience, um, Sorry, can we play the slideshow? Can we keep it going to? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's starting to move. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of that idea of ritual and, you know, thinking about, um, you know, what when, when you get up close to the paintings, mm -hmm. you start to notice the weave, you know, and it's something that you lose also in the photograph. Mm -hmm. um, where you're dealing with X and Y coordinates and you're dealing with um, the existence of time, you know, within the grid, um, but it's imperceptible, mm -hmm. you know? And I think in terms of, of, of the ritual, you know, it's something that I've been doing for so long. I've been painting for 30 years now. Mm -hmm. Um, and many different bodies of work. And um, I think, you know, when I, when I look at these works, when I look at where they come from, at least the lineage and, and you know, kind of the history that they come out of, mm -hmm. um, I can't help but see, you know, the, the ritual behind it. I can't help but see the, the, the elements of communication across time, uh, you know, I, uh, and to get into that kind of personal story, um, 
I these works come out of uh, an experience in which I lost my my mother. She was in Peru at the time. We I I had to go down there and and deal with a lot of that. And you know, in in Peru and like in Mexico and a lot of Latin America, um, there's evidence of of the past in very like uh, quotidian ways. You know, there's there's evidence of in, in Peru they call them wakas, which are like pyramids. A lot like what I imagine like Egypt, I've never been, but of what I imagine like Egypt being like. And, you know, I had an experience where it was as simple as seeing a, a bag of chips that was gold, you know, laying on some dirt in the background was a waka, you know, and, and I don't know if it's, if it's like, to me, that's kind of part of the con contemporary ritual is like putting yourself in the mind state of a ritual mm -hmm. putting yourself and i think in terms of like that experience of, of profound loss in a lot of ways um i think that it forces you into that mental state mm -hmm. you know into that state of seeing time pass and seeing something beyond you know Awesome. And, and so I think that's where the where it starts to resonate with these 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 objects essentially. That's fantastic. I love this idea that after a certain point, all of life becomes an initiation in the work of an artist, and you just start yeah. to see yeah. that all the something objects. as basic as that. Something uh -huh. as basic as that. Yeah, and there's um, I forget who or where I read this. It was in an ethnography that I read uh, of like Tzotzil Mayas. Um, um, and it was talking about contemporary Tzatzil Maya uh, ritual, and it was saying how important um, uh, soda is uh, because it has corn syrup, right? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there's like the spraying of the corn syrup as the corn, right? As the, as the yeah. main is still, a, you know, a, a, a part of it. Uh, and that feels resonant with this kind of idea that um, um, it's not just about the past. It's about the um, uh, uh, the present day histories of the Americas and the realities of the Americas continuing to um, uh, insist upon themselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and I think like in terms of like being a painter, you know, I came out of school a bit confused in a lot of ways, and mm -hmm. and not really understanding where my role was in that. Mm -hmm. And I think because of the nature of, of education in, in art schools and, and just overall, you know, I think what I set out to do after kind of that experience was to immerse myself in, you know, Peruvian painting, Peruvian artists, not just Peruvian, Mexican as well, and, mm -hmm. and really try to like create my own uh, curriculum essentially you That's know I, I went to Peru and I lived in Huancayo which is like east of Lima in the mountains um, and I worked with an artist by the name of Josue Sanchez and and I learned a lot in that experience about kind of about understanding that relationship to the past and to to the current you know all of the current things that that you know the 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 things that matter to to the dialogue hmm. Hmm. You, your mention of art school sets up that other branching question that i had really nicely uh which is about form uh and formalism uh so one of the um things that i think maybe uh, is easy to forget is that when the gold that was taken from the americas was taken back to Europe. It wasn't taken in the form of pendants, crowns, ceremonial jewelry, uh, so on and so forth. It was melted down. Right? It was melted down into uh, ingots, that is to say bars and coins. So what you have effectively is a double theft, right? You have a theft of the gold itself, just the, the material thing, but also about the form, right? Uh, a theft of the, of the form. Uh, uh, of the gold of the Americas. 
And I guess my question has to do with how you thought about form in relation to the aesthetic considerations or formal training of, of, of arts programs in the United States or just that you have experienced. And if you could just say a little bit more about um, 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 how your work is intent on, I feel, breaking a dividing line between aesthetics and politics, right? between mm -hmm. form and the histories of the Americas. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's like a really beautiful way of thinking about like, I mean, it's, it's beautiful in the sense that, you know, you're looking at the, the theft as also not just a physical theft mm -hmm. and of wealth, but the theft of the form. Mm -hmm. And I think that like what we're experiencing, at least a lot of artists that, that are in my generation and, and, and people in my community are grappling with that, um, trying to understand. I think if, if embracing the aesthetic form of, of what your inherited past is, is something radical, mm -hmm. <laughs> It, it, it doesn't seem like it should be that radical, but, but it is in the context of that theft and in the context of that, that attempt at erasure, yeah. you know what I mean? And I think that that's like, you know, I'm, I, I have somewhat of a kind of a, a, a more generous, I think, um, perspective. Mm -hmm towards the theft, you know, I, I don't, I, I try to avoid making the work in that spirit mm -hmm. of, of uh, victimization, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but, and, and more from, a, from, a, from the angle of, a, of an uplifting mm -hmm. kind of, this, this, this work should function for many different people and it should function it should, you know, it, in some ways it's interesting because, you know, you're making me think about like the act of alchemy, ah. you know, and, and I think in that act of reforming mm. these, these, uh, this geometry essentially that's been lost, mm -hmm. you know, and, and originally I think like when, when I started on the Infinite Regress series, I, I, I think I was deeply, uh, I felt much uh, more in a dialogue with the past mm -hmm. um, in the sense that like I almost felt as if it was time travel. Oh. You know, when you spend 20 hours on a painting, you know, and you walk away and then you enter the, the, the everyday real world, it's, it's, it is like time travel. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like community. You're all, yeah. yeah, yeah, and you're collaborating with these ideas of the past. Oh. But there is that theft. There's always that idea of that theft, where, um, where you're working with something that was actively trying, like people were actively trying to destroy, yeah, and to erase. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's and, I think, and I think painting is like an interesting, like. Um, format for that because painting inherently is kind of about history in a lot of ways wow. like it would be different if i was making cumbias about this uh -huh. or if i was like making something you know that was you know painting it, it is it's it, you're dealing with the the legacy of the institutions in a lot of ways mm -hmm. you know uh, much how more than any other medium i think and, you know, I would just add that it's radical. It's only radical because of how uh, deep and longstanding the uh, uh, erasure has been enforced, right? Yeah. Uh, it yeah. isn't an erasure that happened in the past only. It is continuing. No, no, absolutely. It's still happening, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, the video piece that I made, Morococha, mm -hmm. is um, about a Chinese uh, mining company that purchased the land rights under the town of Morococha and moved the whole town. Oh. Um, and so there are these kind of thematics that I start to find. I'm a little bit more like I approach these ideas of uh, more of an intimate uh, involvement with the idea and less of a polemic and less of like a, I don't want to over intellectualize it before I approach it. Yeah. 
but then within it i start to see you know like oh this is about copper this is about people being treated like the dirt that's on top of the copper you know um and so i think in some ways like i don't know i think of painting and i think of these paintings as a regal like uh, uh, a regal um, way of expressing our kind of past in some ways, you know? But I also really try to keep it open to other forms, you know? And, and you turned me on to that book, um, the, the Stone and the Thread. Cesar, Cesar Paternosco. Yeah, yeah. And, and, to me, it was like really amazing to see somebody else kind of mining that territory uh -huh. and like thinking about that, you know, and thinking about its relationship to sociological kind of perspective, like in terms of like communism in, in Russia and, you know, and this like notion of an aesthetic for, for the, the society, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, that book is awesome. If people just, you know, to say it again, if people don't know it, The Stone and the Thread, Cesar Paternosto, uh, published in Spanish, I think, as Piedra Abstracta, uh, uh, which is about uh, the lithic um, architecture of the Andes, that is the stonework, uh, and its relationship to thread, right? To, yeah. to, 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 which, which I, yeah, which I felt like you really understood that in some ways when I first met you through our, through our collaboration, you know, it was like, oh, it was like finding, you know, a kinship in that um, and finding, you know, like a, uh, a simpatico. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I felt, I felt that we were jamming early on and just thinking yeah. about form, you know, and the, right. and the political possibilities of form and it's, uh, and especially because one point that um, Paternosto makes in that book that I found really compelling, even though I don't think it entirely bears itself out, but I do find it compelling, is that Andean um, architecture, uh, classic Andean architecture, is different from classic Mesoamerican architecture in that it's less iconographic, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it's not as focused on uh, representation of figures as it is on design. Uh, and geometry, um, um, and he says that this is because it's referent, the thing that it's looking back to, that architecture is looking back to is textiles. It's not looking mm -hmm. for uh, representations of the gods or something, it's looking back to textiles and it's trying to make a kind of lithic or stonework out of textiles. And just thinking about that as you know, the basis for um, your monumental architecture, for me uh, at least, um, uh, helps to make sense of how um, interwoven Andean architecture can be with the natural world, with like, you know, like forms of the natural world with like the mountain on which it sits or something. Um, yeah, you know, one thing that I, I remember really like made a big impression on me was, you know, going to Peru growing up um, with my family, we never went to Machu Picchu. We never went to archaeological things. We did go to the lines of Nazca, which was amazing. But, um, but we never really went to those type of things. It was always to go see family and to go up into the mountains. And it was a much more kind of um, everyday Peru. Yeah. yeah you know? Yeah. And then when I finally went to Machu Picchu, I think I was in my mid-30s or, or early 30s. And, and I noted that as well because to me, Mexican and Mesoamerican design and architecture is Baroque in that sense. There's your little guy. I love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Baroque, you know, it, it has like every corner is filled with a flower or some face uh -huh. or something, a snake, things yeah. pulling apart. It's, 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 uh, it's, uh, what are they it's symmetrical in a lot of ways and and then when you go to peru and you go to those places like machu picchu um and and just cusco just walking around cusco um immediately the thing that strikes you is the lack of that yes absolutely. and it's almost like uh, a fetish of of surface and a fetish of mass absolutely 
but a map that isn't like arabesque in the sense that everything it, it's more of a reactionary map yeah. you know it's like you said like you know it's reacting to the world that it belongs to it's reacting to the space that it inhabits yeah, it's, um, you know, I've looked into it a little bit and the term that comes up when, um, uh, when that kind of architecture is described where it's like, like stone reactive, that is stone not cut but fit into stone that fits, you know, adjacent stone perfectly is cyclopean. And when I looked up where that term cyclopean comes from, I was really blown away to learn that it's a Greek term for describing Mycenaean architecture uh, you know, an older civilization to the Greeks, and uh, they could not believe that the uh, Mycenaean people could have done such stonework for themselves that they had help from the Cyclopses. Right? <laughs> so, so it's called Cyclopean architecture. Oh, yeah, you, you'll find yourself on the internet, like, you know, if you look up, like, you know, Peruvian stonework, it immediately, immediately goes to a lot of, like, alien, you know, um, you know, but it's yeah. interesting. I like that idea of like the stone form too yeah. is almost like stone that has kind of settled there somehow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not forced in this kind of way. It's very much like, yeah, almost. I mean, you imagine the people sitting there and thinking like, how how do we want the next stone to look? You yeah. know? Yeah. And and one, one of my favorite things when I was in Cusco that I saw was a little tiny museum off the center uh, plaza. And they had the, um, the tools that, that, the, um, that the builders used. Mm -hmm. And they had levels and they had plumb lines. Mm -hmm. And the plumb lines, the plumb bob was a corn, a gold corn on the cob. <laughs> And uh -huh. then the level was a yama, like a, a planed out yama that you put the water in and then you could tell, you know, how level it was. Uh, yeah. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. But uh, very, but, but I think there is something to that. I think there is something to that. Um, geometric reference. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I think when I look at these two, when I look at this image right now, you know, we when we first started talking, when we collaborated on the book mm -hmm. with your poetry, and you know, I you have that 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 one poem that has a parabola, like a ring in the nostrils. You are not God, after all. So how do you propose to read the symbols? How do you peer through the pay stubs for a mythic view of tomorrow? how to stare at these flows into submission. You know, I, I, I think of like, I, we were talking about this nose ring that, that blocks your mouth, you know, because it's the holy word. It's the word you don't want to see the speaker speaking, you know, and, you know, there, there's certain kind of things that are necessary that, that force the design, that yeah. force the, the aesthetic. Yeah. I, I yeah. love the way that you described it in terms of reaction. I just have to show the book too. I feel like I'm on Reading Rainbow right now. I just have to <laughs> show the book because it's yeah, a really sure. beautifully designed book uh, by uh, Ella, Ella or Aya. Aya, uh, yeah. yeah. And I like Ella too. I like Ella. Ella Steven Serrato, Bombia. Beautifully designed book, and I was so proud to be in collaboration with you. Uh, but, you know, just to kind of hook back to this way in which you described the stonework as reactive, I think that's really, there's a lot to um, think through and thinking about it that way, because we don't tend to think of stone as reactive. We tend to think of it in a kind of deeper temporal duration. It just sits, right? Stone yeah. just sits. Uh, yeah. We tend to forget in our limited human sense of time that stone also adapts. It situates, it fits, it moves around, it changes, it pushes, it gets moved beyond where it's supposed to be by you know, uh, uh, glaciers and so on and so forth. Um, and I guess you know, that's just another way of coming back to this question of time and how you're thinking about um, deep time and, uh, um, and longer durations, maybe even environmental ecological durations, if at all, in your um, engagement with the stonework of uh, 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 yeah, I mean, I think it's really, it's interesting too. I'm, I'm like partly reacting to the slides that are showing up too. And like what you're talking about time. 
and like the contemporary relationship to the past and its implements, its ritualistic implements. And, and like, this is the Tekendama, this is from Colombia. And you're talking about those deep kind of currents of time. Because if we think about time as a flow, right? And if according to like, you know, theories of relativity, gravity does affect time at some point, mm -hmm. um, then, then there are deeper flows of time. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a surface, you know, just like in, in the ocean, you have surface uh, currents and then you have a deeper current that actually carries water from Greenland all the way down to, the, to South Africa, mm -hmm. you know, underneath all of that, you know? And, and when I see this Tekendama, I'll go back one, you know, when I was really, when I was getting into um, Sonidero music and Cumbia music and collecting a lot of records, I would come across the Tekendama de Oro. Mm -hmm. And I was always really like curious what, what this was. It was what is it? Know? And it was, a, it was a Colombian award given to Mexican Sonideros that would play Cumbia music. Oh. And so here's this kind of, you know, Tekendama, this ancient image, this ancient uh, uh, representation of kind of almost like crystallis, uh -huh. you know? And then it, it lives on in this contemporary context, you know? Um, and I think of, I, I think that time, like back to that idea of like when I'm painting, it is kind of like communing with that, 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 that potential of time being malleable, mm. you know, the potential of time having a conversation across millennia instead of trying to react always to the contemporary, mm. you know, mm. and trying to react only to what's happening right now. This is, um, you got to say something about this. This is so interesting. This is one of the ways in which gold was sent back to Spain. Right. Yeah. So, you know, all that beautiful work that we saw before, you know, I kind of view those, those works in the beginning of the slideshow as like, um, you know, they, that they're rare and like fragile survivors, mm -hmm. you know, that they, that they didn't get melted down, that they didn't get, that they avoided somehow. And then they also survived being dug up by grave robbers and, you know, sold to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. uh, or actually, they did get sold to the Metropolitan. <laughs> or, you, right? yeah. or, or, yeah. But, but um, you know, so a lot of it, what we're looking at right now is a lot of that. Mm -hmm. We're looking at masks and, and earrings and crowns and nose rings and countless other images. But we're looking at it in the form of the the pure unadulterated economic value right here you know yeah, yeah. and so what so this is a, a peruvian escudo mm -hmm. and it was i believe this is from the early 1700s yeah. and this is a they call them cobs which i think is kind of interesting too kind of like corn on the cob corn having that like reoccurring kind of gold uh, imagery and what this was all Spanish coins were imprinted with the these pillars which represent the pillars of Gibraltar the pillars of Hercules Wow! and then they had um, these letters right here represent plus ultra Americas wow. and on the original pillars of Hercules in the, the stone of Gibraltar, like in Gibraltar, uh, there's an inscription that says non plus ultra. Huh. And it was a warning to anybody leaving the Mediterranean yeah. was to say, you know, non plus ultra for if you go beyond this point, mm -hmm. you know, danger is beyond this point. And mm -hmm. so when the Spanish had, you know, successfully done the crossing and, and extraction and everything, it was their way of saying like plus ultra, we, we've gone to the beyond, you know. Yeah. And that those pillars still live on in our dollar sign. Yeah. 
you know, the dollar sign, those two lines that go through the S are the pillars of Gibraltar. Right. I hadn't thought about that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Huh. Um, and just to further contextualize gold, um, uh, I don't know if we've come across the gold spike. I know it was in the previous slideshow. Is it in this slideshow? These uh, are fascinating. Yeah, there we I mean, go. Let's just stop at the last one for one more second because I think that oh, yeah. it, just, it just shows uh, uh, what became of the gold and also how there was a re-imprinting of form, new form, the, the, the form of colonial order, right? Uh, the, yeah. the Straits of Gibraltar, the conquest of the Americas um, um, in these objects. Um, uh, which I think really ties in neatly and nicely to the um, uh, last object. I don't know if it's the last object in the slide, but I know it's the next one. Um, the golden spike, the spike that was driven into the trans, was it the transcontinental uh, railroad by uh, who other than, was it Leland Stanford himself? Yeah. And I, you know, I guess it's kind of a cheeky question, but I wonder if you could just talk a little bit in the context of Stanford and the golden spike about what, um, this means for your uh, upcoming exhibition? Yeah, I mean, I... Well, first of all, like I want to give props to the um, Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford, as well as the Anderson. And, you know, learning, I honestly didn't know a lot about Stanford. Um, and the more that I read and the more that I learned about the railways and and I think like you and I had kind of riffed on it before this idea of like gold being imprinted across uh, geography mm -hmm. and and like you had mentioned too yeah like the 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 pillars of Hercules you know saying like you know this defines the known world mm -hmm. you know good luck if you go past this. You know, and, and to me, it's really fascinating this, the spike because of its celebration of, you know, you see the text right here, you know, unite the two great oceans of the world, you know, mm -hmm. the Atlantic and the Pacific. Totally. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I started the series in that personal place you know, kind of grappling with personal issues, I guess, you know, and looking for like a way to transcend a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and it's cool to see that like the material can speak for itself, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that looking at the golden spike and, and, you know, the, the, the exhibition that we'll be doing at the Anderson um, is an extension of that, the material speaking for itself, hmm. you know? Hmm. And so what, you know, I, I don't know, I, I probably won't get into it too much, but, you know, the, the golden spike and its, and its, the, its copies will, will make its appearance in the exhibition. And, and this idea of like um, expansion hmm. plus hmm. ultra, you know? Mm. Non plus ultra, plus ultra. Always the yeah. plus ultra. Always the <laughs> always go for the plus ultra. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm I'm still processing, you know, some of some of the the relationships and the correlations. But you know, being an American as well, you know, I feel in some ways like my identity is synthesized. Oh. You no, know, it's 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 created of many different things and. And like to learn about that legacy of the railways and mm -hmm. to learn about that legacy of like the connection between the East Coast, the West Coast and, and what we live in now and where we are right now and how much that plays into everything. You know? I have so many more questions and we could jam on as you I know. know. I know. But it's there are some uh, questions in the Q&A docket and I feel sure. we ought to give some um, uh, uh, privilege of place to the audience and you know, the, um, uh, the good responses that we've had. So uh, if I could just relay them, uh, yeah. a couple of them to you, um, um, to us, I suppose. Uh, and it seems like um, uh, two have to do with process and two have to do with uh, history or historicity. 
maybe I'll start with the process because this gets back to the um, question of ritual. Um, and, it, and it just wants to know how you prepare for your paintings to make the substrata or overlays, this junction of lines. Um, do you work first in software or do you, do you draft or do you just go right to the canvas? No, I go straight to the canvas. The, the, what I do is I worked for a long time um, at a stretcher bar company, like building stretcher bars. And that exposed me to like certain techniques and stuff that, you know, are kind of outdated in some ways. Like um, I use rabbit skin glue, mm. which is something that they've been using, you know, since the 1400s or probably before, long before probably. Mm. Um, and, you know, I don't need to use it. I could use a synthetic uh, type of, of PVA or something like that, but I I like the the I like cooking the glue up. I like the effect that it gives the 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 linen, oh. and and what it does is kind of it's almost like a, a starch, you know. Oh. It's it's a protein essentially, you know. Oh. It, it tightens up the linen and it. And it really kind of, um, and it makes it almost like a living thing, you know. When when you paint these, when when you paint them with rabbit skin and glue, they really bow. They almost look like they're almost gonna break, and then yeah. overnight they relax and then they, they get flat again. Yeah. Um, so like that in terms of technique, you know, and the paint. The reason why I don't really need to do it, but I, I just enjoy doing it, and it's something that I've been doing. I did for so long for many other painters. You know, as when I was working as a stretcher, you know, at the stretcher bar company, um, is uh, it, it's part of that ritual. Mm. You know, kind of like okay, prepping. It's like tanning the hide. You know, mm. getting it nice and you know, give it give it all of the tension that it needs, and you know, but um, but the paint is is a synthetic, so it doesn't need it. You know, mostly that rabbit skin glue is used for oil paints that's you know, that the yeah. oil doesn't doesn't eat up the, the linen but yeah so, that's that's a tech so it's not so the canvas is just untreated linen untreated lin linen with rabbit skin glue with rabbit skin glue yeah. as the and and yeah and in terms of like you know like the question i think involved like computer or like do i use a computer no like everything to me you know a lot of this work comes out of my desire to step away from any kind of technology um, to, to, you know, if, if I was, you know, left with just a ruler and a pencil, what could I do, uh -huh. you know, but, but actually a lot of the circles that are written on the larger works that originally came out um, in this series are derived from tracing my first album that I made. Uh -huh. um, the, the um, actually I can show you. Oh, here it is. We're getting a little studio tour. Yeah, this is a, a dub plate. Oh. And what they do is this is the original. Oh. And and then they make all the other the albums based on that. Oh. And this oh. was like the first album that I did. First DJ Lengua album. Oh. Yeah, and so you know, trace it onto the linen, and then go from there. So a yeah. lot of these are are you know improvisations. You know, really? yeah, really? and and, the, and yeah. that's incredible. Well, well, and and part of it too is like establishing that language, mm -hmm. you know. And I think like what you were saying about like, um, you know, in terms of like a relationship to to. Like a like a language that that goes back in time. Like in some ways, you know, once you establish the language, then you can kind of express yourself within that wherever you want to. It doesn't, you know what I mean? Like um, like almost like classical in that sense. Mm -hmm. You know, it becomes kind of classical in that sense. We have a question um, that is about the Chinese mining company that you mentioned, uh, and it just asks a little bit more about. Chinese mining in Peru. And I wonder if I might expand and elaborate the question a little bit more to ask about trans-Pacific connections. 
Are there any trans specific connections specific to your work? So not only thinking about it in relation to the American hemisphere, but you know, across the ocean to the West. Yeah, the company is called Chinalco. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's interesting because like I remember having these conversations with cousins of mine in Lima. And you know, they were all really intelligent young young people and they were becoming engineers and they'd gone through years of school and everything but the glass ceiling in in those countries is so low mm. because everything gets exported as a raw material mm. nothing mm. gets processed there mm. you know mm. and and so i think like we're still trapped in that in that cycle huh. where we we provide the material right you know um and i you know in terms of that that piece morococha you know there's a lot of different layers to it um and um one of the layers i think is also like growing up in the 80s and 90s you know my relationship to peru was very much during the shining path oh and I think like that relationship, it's really, it was really kind of almost like a marker of, um, of time passing, seeing a Chinese mining company taking control mm -hmm. of the land, almost as if the Americans and the Canadians had done prior. Right. You know, and so the relationship when I was young was more of, and the shining path for those of you who don't know, it was a Maoist um, uh, revolutionary group. Mm -hmm. And so they were very much, you know, uh, aligned with, you know, Chinese communist type of um, uh, thought. Mm -hmm. And then to see China also having it evolved in the past 30 years, 20 years, mm -hmm. to being one of the extractors, mm -hmm. you know, in Peru, um, was an interesting dimension to it, you know? Honestly, um, I didn't really explore that in the piece, but it, you know, there's many different dimensions to it. And in terms of like that relationship to the Pacific, um, I think I'm more, I think I'm still in the mode of understanding like a Pan Americanism, mm. you know, and like thinking about the Americas outside of the national boundaries and more along the cultural trade routes you know mm -hmm. and and so i haven't really explored that very much that that piece though was shown as part of an exhibition that was exploring the the um the the relationships to china mm -hmm. and latin america I want to there's a lot of similarity i mean there's no surprise why the shining path was maoist based mm -hmm. because it was believing in like a a revolution from the campesinos from the countryside into the city huh. you know not from the city out to the country yeah that i mean that's properly malice right? just, yeah yeah totally and it's just interesting to see how much i think in some ways like the piece as i made it became more of an exploration in kind of the 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 way things have changed and my own thinking has changed and mm -hmm. maybe my own sympathies have changed on mm -hmm. some levels you know, I had conversations with cousins that were very pro mining, you know, very pro, this is how we develop, this is how, you know, and, and who was I as an American to have that, you know, uh, opposing you, you know, so it was a really interesting kind of dynamic. Yeah, I think that anyone who is engaged as an artist, uh, poet, maker, um, uh, engage with the histories of the Americas, that is to say, engage with the histories of colonialism, always has to swallow the poison. And you have to swallow <laughs> the poison and turn it into gold, right? That's the job. <laughs> swallow poison and sweat gold. So yeah, sweat, sweat it out, out. sweat it out. Uh, and, and on that note, uh, just I want to say we're out of time for questions, but I want to ask one last one because I think it's a good one to end on, uh, which is, uh, Eamon, if you could include one of the gold objects in your exhibition, what would it be? We know that one of the spikes is in the exhibition, but I think that the question is more of the 
uh, with regard to the um, um, uh, Andean gold work that we've seen. So if you could pick any one uh, of those objects to be in the exhibition, which one would it be? Why? In the slideshow? Yeah, in the slideshow. Oh God, that's a good question. I think, you know what, I'll just kind of flip through really quickly because I think it's in the later part. Mm -hmm. This. Ah, interesting. Huh. Why? I think it goes back to that, that purity of form kind of idea in terms of um, it's not embossed. It's not, it's really about, I almost start to just focus on that exterior, those exterior lines, mm -hmm. you know? And I think of these as one of many, you know? Like, I mean, I see these little, little kind of sections here down at the bottom kind of poking down as like, you know, imagine like a whole headdress of these, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think of them as like a part to a bigger whole. Oh. I think that's partly why I, I, I don't see it as a singular object. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bringing us back to this idea of the sun we can see, but not fully. Yeah. Day yeah. See, but not fully. Yeah. 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 And, and I mean, we could, we could have, we could go off on that too. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, yeah there's, there's definitely some of that going on in the work, celestial kind of movements and, and hiding and revealing, you know. Amen, it's been an awesome conversation. Yeah, uh, likewise, Edgar. Able to have it here with you and I'm really grateful to the Anderson Collection for hosting you, for hosting your exhibition, for bringing me on board into this conversation. I'm uh, honored that I just wanna extend my uh, thanks as we hand it over um, to, uh, awesome. Daphne, who, um, I think we'll wrap us up now. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so you much. Edgar. Thank Thanks you. so much, man. I'll, uh, I'll, I think I'll stop sharing that. Yeah. Thank you so much to both of you, um, Eamon and Edgar. This was a wonderful, rich, dynamic conversation. So everybody, we hope you'll join us for some upcoming events with Eamon um, on next Thursday, October 29th, and then Thursday, November, November 12th. And these events will highlight video, music, and dance influences on Amon's practice. So thank you for attending. Stay safe and be well. And we look forward to seeing you all.